Hi, so in this video, I'd like to go over some Bitcoin internal stuff. I've been very interested in Bitcoin and kind of the internals of how it actually works for a couple of months now. And one of the foundational building blocks of the Bitcoin system is the block itself. And one of the things that you can quite easily grasp is the concept of a Merkle tree or a Merkle root. So Merkle trees were named after its creator, Ralph Merkle, in the in around the 70s. And essentially what they do is they allow you to summarize a data set into one hash and anything that happens in that data set ordering changes bit ch uh, bit changes bit flips etc will be represented in that hash and change it will change the hash dramatically so the beauty of that then is obviously it makes it cheaper for you to be able to verify that this list of transactions that I've given you is exactly what I expected you to have. I borrowed this diagram from the Mastering Bitcoin book, uh, which is a very good book and I highly recommend it. I'll, I'll put it down in the description below. And um, what you can see here then is we have our transactions, which are our leaves. And each transaction is a transaction hash so that comprises of the data from that transaction. And then each subsequent pair, we then hash up and we build up and we hash again so you can get this nice tree structure. So the idea being then is that by the end, we get one single hash that represents that whole entire data structure, which is extremely powerful. One thing that we should note actually is, and this is again borrowed from the book, is that if you don't have an even amount of leaves, what we do is we actually duplicate the, the final leaf. So you can see here that we've got, say, C, and we've actually duplicated it, and we hash it with itself to generate the hash, the subsequent parent hash. And again, that goes in. So that's just an implementation detail. So what I want to do now is actually go over to JSBin and actually create an implementation that will verify a transaction list. So we're going to get in all the transactions from an API source, and we're actually going to generate this Merkle tree ourselves and generate the Merkle root and verify that that's the one that actually exists within the block itself. Okay, so now we're in JSBin. What we're going to do first is I'm going to actually find the latest block that actually has been published onto the Bitcoin blockchain. And what we're going to do with that is we're going to then grab the contents, the, the transactions within that, and we're going to actually going to compute the Merkle tree ourselves from those transaction hashes and then compare it with the blockchain's hash. So we can just see how the process works at a fundamental level. So the first thing I wanna do is to fetch the latest block. And we're gonna fetch it from blockchain.info, which provides a nice cause interface for me to actually access it. And then all we do with the result is we're gonna grab the text from it. So let's see how this works. So fetch latest block and then console log that out. And we'll see. So you can see here, this is the latest block that's been published on the blockchain. So you can work out exactly when I recorded this because you know, with, with every 10 minutes we should be getting a new block. So with that now done, let's pull out the Merkle root and the transactions for this. So we're gonna say fetch Merkle roots and transactions. And we're gonna pass in a block. So we've got the block that we want. And we're simply going to fetch again using blockchain.info the raw block information for that. And then I'm going to pass it as JSON because it gives me back JSON. And then I'm simply going to, with the data, I'm going to pull out the Merkle root and I'm going to get each of the transactions. And because the transactions are in an array format, I'm going to pull out, pluck out the hashes for each one of those. And again, let's let's join these two together now. So I'm going to fetch the latest block. Then with that information, I'm then going to fetch the Merkle roots and transactions. And then finally, I'm going to console log that out. Plenty of transactions to process. And we can see here that this here is the Merkle root. So now we've got a bit of boilerplate in. Let's actually start codifying the computation for actually verifying this Merkle root. So the first thing we need is we need to be able to hash hashes together. So the way that Bitcoin actually does this is it uses something called double SHA-256 hashing, and it does it in a big endian format. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the HTML, and I'm just going to imp import an, an easy SHA-256 library. So we've got that all done. Okay, so then what we're going to do is we're going to implement our hash pair. So the idea is we hash each pair like the diagram showed, and the concept of if we haven't got a B, because there may, it may be even, we're going to hash itself. And then what we need to do now, the way that the SHA-256 library actually works is we need to provide it with a byte array. So we need to convert these hashes into byte arrays for us to actually, to actually process. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna get the bytes and we're gonna say, we're gonna create a function called two bytes. And all this is gonna do is it's gonna join the two 
hashes together and then do the reverse that we need to do to be able to actually store this in little endian format. With that done, we can then do, so hashed, SHA-256 array, and we're doing double 256. So I think this actually, the reason why um, Shitoshi went with this is because I think there's like a birthday attack or some replay attack that we can actually do with this. I'll put that in the show notes as well, why we actually decide, why he decided to do a double SHA-256. Pass in the bytes, and then finally, just to make this function a little easier to understand with what it's returning, I'm just gonna reverse it and move it and put it back into hex. So there's a couple of things we have to implement here, but you can see here it's providing the very fundamental building block of how we hash things. We hash things based on A and B, so we're going to get two inputs in. If we haven't got a second input, we're going to reuse A. We're then going to join the two together, and then we get the bytes from that. So we're able to get the byte sequence from those hex values, and we reverse those so it can be dealt with in the way that Bitcoin wants to hash things, which is in little endian format. We then actually do the double hash with those bytes. Once we've got the hashed bytes back, we then reverse it back to how we want to display it, and then we just do a two hex, so it provides hexes to hexes. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to make the two bytes implementation. So all this is doing is it's just from with the hex character, with the hex uh, string that's provided, we split it up into its subsequent pairs, and then each one of them we then pass it as an integer, which will give us back in base 10 the um, the value, the representation, and provide the array, which we can then use in our SHA-256 array library. And then we also then need to convert this back to two hex, and what we're going to do is we're going to get bytes in and with each of the bytes we're going to reduce that down and then accumulate with bytes dot two string 16 and because this may not actually produce a, a, a two characters we then want to pad the start of it if it's not two characters with a leading zero so this makes it then that we can actually do this again so we know it's every two uh, and then we just have a default. So this is just reducing the bytes down into a nice string representation of the hex. And then this one, into, uh, you know, is doing the opposite where it's getting the hex in and it's reducing the hex value, the hex string down into a base 10 array of bytes. With those building blocks now in place, we can now hash pairs. So let's actually create the base function that we're going to use. We're going to pass in some transactions and we're going to do a base case. So because this is going to be a recursive algorithm, we're going to do a base case. If it's one, we're just going to pass back the root because once we've then trickled up, we've gone all the way up to the root. We can now just pass it. We know there's only one in the transaction array, which has been reduced down. We can use that as the return value. And then we want to actually call itself. So we're going to say Merkle roots and we're going to do two pairs. So we're going to split off each transaction into a pair. And then we're going to do a reduce on this. And we're going to get our tree and get our pair. And let me just move this a bit over because it's going to be a little bit bigger. And we're going to then say for each pair, hash pair in here, dot, 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 pair. Okay. And finally, we need to have a base reduce value. Okay. So let me just clean this up a little bit because it's not looking too nice. Do that and do that. So you can see here then what we've got is we pass in our transactions. We have a base case of if we've reduced it down to just the one value, we know that's the Merkle root. Else what we do is we call ourselves and we call ourselves with two pairs. So we split them out. We need to implement this. So we, each subsequent pair of transactions, we break it up. We then reduce that down into... Here's the tree, which is our start with nothing. Here's our pair. And then with the pair, we just join it up, accumulate it up into the tree, and we hash pair each subsequent one. So the great thing about this is that this will spread it out. But if there's only one in the pair, it will spread it out to one argument. So then our default will, to be, will be catered for, which will then use B, will then set B to whatever A is. So this is just a nice little trick you can do. So now we've got the Merkle root in place. We've got the hash pairs, we've got the two hex, and we've got the two bytes. We just need to do the two pair. So let's add in here const two pair. And I'm just going to copy this in. This was shamelessly uh, borrowed from Stack Overflow. Uh, essentially, all this does is it goes through the array and it quite cleverly just picks out each individual pair. And with the last one, it will just be on its own if it's a odd length in the array. 
So let's see this at work then. So let's actually start building this up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fetch the latest block. I'm then going to fetch the Merkle root and transactions. I'm then, so let me just break this up and clean this up a little bit. Now I've got the Merkle root and I've got the transactions. Let's get those. So I can go in here and I can say I've got the Merkle. So I've got the root and I've got the transactions. And in here we can actually do some stuff. So let me just ensure that I've actually got these. So this is correctly destructured that with root and console log out the transactions. See that? A huge list of transactions to handle. Okay, so now we've got that. Now what we can do is we can actually create our own generated one. So what we can say is we can say is valid. So we can say, is it valid with us? And we assume that if we do our Merkle root and we pass in all these transactions, it should equal the root that they give us. And we can then say console is valid. And let's see if our computation actually does the work that it should do. So there's one thing actually that I need to add on, and that is with JSBin, because of how much how much recursion we're doing in here, it's actually quite clever. It tries to protect you from actually just doing infinite loops. But I need just to say, no, don't worry about doing that. I understand that this is going to be quite intensive. So we just need to put no protect at the top. Yeah, so it's true. So our Merkle root that we've computed is the same as the root that's actually in the block, which is great. Yeah, so I hope this has helped out kind of demystify how Bitcoin uses Merkle trees and Merkle roots and, and how they're actually computed. Okay, so until next time, goodbye.